Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 3.13, Carolina Splits Up. Welcome back. This week, we are going to head back up to Carolina for the first time really since Episodes 2.3 and 2.4 of last season. We have, of course, talked about Carolina in the past few weeks. We spent some time in the northern portion of the colony, which would become North Carolina, which had become something of a pirate haven back in episode 3.10. During our time looking at Queen Anne's War, we had spent a significant amount of time down in the southern portion of the colony, the future South Carolina, which would prove to be a major front of that conflict. However, beyond that, we really have not spent a great deal of time in Carolina. Part of the reason for this is that they were a relative latecomer to the colonial game. The Chesapeake colonies and New England, including for the sake of this discussion New York, have long been at the center of our story because they have been around for so much longer. Pennsylvania, which is also a younger colony, is right smack dab in the middle of everything. The effect of this is that despite being a younger colony, Pennsylvania was in a central location and became a hub for trade, giving the colony increased importance early on. This week, I want to take a tour through what has been going on in Carolina for some time now. First, however, we need to address the fact that there is a North and a South Carolina. Once we accomplish that, we are going to spend the rest of the episode looking at the often contentious relationship that both the North and South had with their proprietors. John Locke had been the guy who drew up the weird quasi-feudal system that defined the colony during those early years. Now, we can look at how it had actually worked out in reality. Finally, we are going to see that trend away from proprietary colonies continue. This is nothing new, as we have seen it throughout the colonial system, and even in some of our more recent episodes, we have continued to watch this trend develop. Pennsylvania aside, there was a definite movement away from proprietary colonies and converting those into royal colonies. This was largely a result of the often ineffective leadership of the proprietors, plus the fact that having a single colonial system likely would collect higher revenue for the crown. We will explore exactly what that means for both North and South Carolina this week. Ultimately, the quasi-feudal system in Carolina failed to ever really gain much traction. We have already spent a good amount of time on this podcast discussing the fact that proprietary governments were quickly falling out of favor. We have spent several episodes this season looking at the phenomenon specifically with respects to Maryland and Pennsylvania. As was the case in both of those two colonies, Carolina had little interest, initially at least, in being taken over by the crown. For their part, the colonies did at least go through the motions and wasted zero time in declaring William and Mary the new monarchs in the aftermath of the fall of James II. Carolina had gone through something of an internal division as well at this time. When we first discussed the Carolina colonies back in episodes 2.3 and 2.4 last season, we had only discussed a single unitary colony. Of course, we know simply by looking at the map that at some point, Carolina is going to divide into North and South. This division, as it turns out, is not something born out of any real animosity towards each other. There is not going to be some great Carolinian civil war, but rather it was a function of pragmatism. Carolina was sparsely populated, with a population between both North and South of around 10,000 combined in 1690. Well, that may sound like a decent number of people. Remember that the colony included everything from the Virginia border down to Florida. 10,000 people over such a large area created challenges for the colony. For the practical governance of the colony, this was a real problem and necessitated that there needed to be a north and a south. Well, pragmatism over a sparse population helped to fuel that split between the colonies. That is not to say that they really had anything in common and that they in fact got along. North and South Carolina would ultimately end up attracting very different populations. In the northern portion of Carolina, there was a definite sense of discontent from those colonists who had at one point been part of the Virginia colony. 
When the proprietors had gotten their land grant, they took over land that had previously been under the jurisdiction of Virginia, much to the chagrin of those colonists. They had gone from a governmental system that they understood to some weird system that they had no interest in participating in. Likewise, in what would become South Carolina, the majority of the colonists there were those resettling from the West Indies. They would bring over not only a good deal of material wealth, often in the form of slaves, but they also came along with an idea for how a colony should run. They had long played sick and fiddle back in the West Indies, and they were sick of it. This is the reason that they resettled to Carolina. This group was not radically different from those in the North, those colonists who had previously considered themselves to be part of Virginia. Both groups hated the proprietors. This brings up an important point that is really going to help define much of the events of the first several decades of Carolina history. Absolutely nobody likes the proprietors. Part of the problem for the proprietors came from the very methods that they used to attract new colonists. If you'll recall, many of those that came over and settled in Carolina did so to escape the huge landowners in the West Indies. The islands of the West Indies were, relatively speaking, rather small, and had quickly become overpopulated. This drove up land prices, which had the effect of squeezing out the smaller farmers. Carolina, on the other hand, offered nearly unlimited land. For somebody looking at having their own large-scale plantation, Carolina seemed like a pretty good bet. At the same time, the proprietors were anxious to rapidly grow their population, both as a function of economic stability, as well as the fact that Spanish threats to the South and Indian threats to the West did exist. A large population was much less vulnerable to an attack. The effect of this is that the colonists who were settling Carolina, especially in the South, were made up of people who could not make it in the Indies and could not compete against those huge landowners. They relocated to Carolina looking for an opportunity to have their own large plantations. The new colony had few restrictions, and a generous head right system had helped spur growth as well. The proprietors granted the landowners virtually no restrictions on slavery, which, when combined with large plantations, would allow the practice to flourish in the region. I'm going to hold off for today on talking more about slavery in the Carolinas, because in the very near future, it is going to be the subject of its own episode. However, do be aware that Carolina would end up having a very large slave population. One of the problems for the proprietors, however, is that the large landowners and the richest people coming over from the Indies, a group known as the Goose Creek Men, quickly came to dominate the assembly. This group had money. They had power. They had influence. This was a serious problem for the proprietors who quickly found that their control and influence over the colony was beginning to wane. The immediate effect of this is that it forced the proprietors to seek out governors for the colony that could rein in the various interests and attempt to get control. Considering that between 1680 and 1695, they went through 12 different administrations, does not exactly indicate that they had much success in this search. With the proprietors dealing with the colonists in the South that wanted to do their own thing, and colonists in the North that were upset at having been included in the colony in the first place, the proprietors made the decision to split the colony into two. The hope is that by doing this, they could better pacify the entire population. Practically speaking, the split took place in 1691. However, it would not become official until 1712. Upon splitting the colony, it meant now that both colonies would have separate assemblies and separate governors. In North Carolina, this meant that politics became dominated largely by that contingent from Virginia. In the South, it was the Goose Creek men that would come to run the show. Despite the division of the colony, the proprietors still faced a population that was becoming increasingly hostile towards them. South Carolina politics had become dominated by the Goose Creek men. These were those colonists that had come largely from the West Indies. Generally wealthy and influential, they wasted zero time in making the colony their own. Nowhere was this more clear than in the scope of religion. We have discussed that, for the most part, 
new colonies tended towards religious tolerance. Not necessarily because they wanted to have a melting pot of religions, but rather because practically most young colonies were desperate to boost their population numbers, and religious tolerance in the late 17th century was one way to achieve that end. The Goose Trick men, however, were not a tolerant group and were deeply vested with the Anglican Church. They were able to quickly strip away the previously tolerant nature of the colony, establishing that only Anglicans could hold office within South Carolina. Using Queen Anne's War as a justification for the expulsion of the Huguenots, the Goose Trick men would move one step further in 1704 by passing a bill that only members of the Anglican Church could become members of the assembly. This was followed up by another bill that allowed money to be taken directly from the public treasury for the construction of a local parish. Despite the fact that the non-Anglicans in the colony would challenge the assembly's bill directly to London and were actually successful in getting the law overturned, in 1706, a similar bill was presented and passed, this time with the approval of the proprietors, meaning that this law was going to stand. This is obviously problematic for anybody in the colony that was not an Anglican. There were people who had moved specifically to South Carolina because they had been under the impression that they would find religious tolerance there. However, with the Goose Creek men now in power, the assembly, and the proprietors themselves were just dumping the founding principles of the colony aside. Suddenly, this group found themselves alienated and unable to muster any kind of political power to even fight their case. As we have seen throughout so many of the colonies, this is really going to just kick off a process of widespread alienation. It's not just the now religious outcasts that are going to be alienated from the political power of the colony, but it would also be the proprietors. Amongst this group of non-Anglicans, the proprietors were now viewed as that group that sold them out. Unfortunately for the proprietors, Despite this acquiescence towards the demands of the Goose Creek men, they remained deeply unpopular, even amongst that group. The Goose Creek men just largely ignored the proprietors, and worse, they dominated the South Carolina Assembly. The entire ordeal had left the proprietors without a single friend in the colony, as they were now largely viewed as the bad guys everywhere. Queen Anne's War did little to improve the situation as the proprietors were largely absent during the entire conflict. Despite requests from the colonists to the proprietors for supplies and funds to carry out a war against the Spanish and Indian forces, their pleas fell upon deaf ears. Back during episode 3.11, we discussed the position of South Carolina during Queen Anne's War. It was not just some vague threat of attack, but rather there were battles actively fought within the colony. Let us not forget that the Spanish had invaded, landing at Charleston, and despite the fact that the South Carolina militia had ultimately won the day, in very convincing fashion, the fact was not lost on anybody in the colony that their pleas for assistance were ignored by the proprietors. Religious dissent aside, the wheels really begun to come off for the proprietors in 1715, when the Yamasee War broke out. The war would prove to be devastating, as South Carolina was ravaged by the aggrieved Yamasee tribe. During Queen Anne's War, the Yamasee tribe had closely aligned with the Carolinians. It was indeed the Yamasee tribe that had accompanied the colonists on their attacks throughout Spanish Florida. Despite this close alliance, by the time that Queen Anne's War was coming to an end, there was a rapidly growing discontent amongst the Yamasee tribe. They had fallen deeply into debt with the English and had become frustrated over years of poor pay for their efforts in Queen Anne's War. On April 15, 1715, the Yamasee launched their initial attack against some British traders. The attack opened up widespread violence from other tribes, many of which had aligned with Carolina during Queen Anne's War, such as the Creek. What would follow was a 13-year period of violence between the colonists and the frontier Indians in Carolina. This would not be consistent violence, but would be a long, drawn-out period of fighting with frequent breaks in the attacks. In something of an interesting twist of irony, it was suddenly the Spanish 
who were arming the Creek and the Yamasee for their raids against the English. The war itself in many ways resembled King Philip's War. South Carolina deployed their militia. However, throughout the conflict, there were few pitched battles. Rather, it would be those hit-and-run tactics that we have seen for decades in New England, now being deployed against Carolina. As a hint of just how serious the situation had become, there was serious discussion about arming slaves, and in some cases they were actually armed and used in fighting the war. Again, we are going to talk much more in depth about slavery here in a few episodes, but suffice it to say that this was not a discussion that anybody would have unless the situation was absolutely dire. As time went on, throughout the war, you would see tribes drop out of the conflict at different points, such as the Creek in 1717. Generally, the tribes pulling out of the war would attempt to declare neutrality when it came to colonial affairs, something that was often easier said than done. The Yamasee War would officially come to an end in 1727. Well, we are not going to spend a whole lot of time on the war itself. Suffice it to say that it had been a major blow in South Carolina. In the wake of the decades-long war, over 400 colonists had been killed. While it does not, on its face, sound like a huge number, keep in mind that Carolina remained lightly populated, and the danger on the frontier had brought with it significant economic effects as well. For the colonists, one of the most disturbing parts of the Yamasee War was that the proprietors did absolutely nothing to assist in the matter. Despite pleas from the colonists, the proprietors had remained silent during the war. Military aid was offered from Virginia. However, that came at a high price as the Virginia colonists wanted slaves from South Carolina, something that the South Carolina colonists were very hesitant to do. For the proprietors, this was the second time since the turn of the century that they just basically ignored the pleas of their colonists. It was not something that would be lost on London. Ultimately, in South Carolina, this would mark the beginning of the end for proprietary government. Aggravated over years of being ignored by the Lord Proprietors, the events of the Yamasee War caused the cry for royal governance to become louder than ever before. A major difference now, however, is that the British had taken note of how little the proprietors had done in defense of the colony. As we have already seen, the British by this point were no longer huge supporters of the proprietary model anyway, and were anxious to transition everything over into royal colonies. The South Carolinians in 1719 decided that they had had enough, and went ahead and elected their own governor, James Moore. Now, before there is any confusion, this is actually James Moore II. His father, James Moore I, is the guy we saw a few weeks ago leading the attack on St. Augustine. He died back in 1706. The actions by South Carolina would prove successful, and in 1720, the British sent a royal governor to take over the colony. Who did the British send over to govern, you ask? Well, we know that Edmund Andros is already dead, so it could only be, yes, that's right, Francis Nicholson. Last time we saw Nicholson was, well, last episode, when he had to give up on his mission to take Quebec. It would fall to Nicholson to help convert the colony over to a royal system of government. Well, South Carolina now had a royal governor, the actual process in changing the colony to a royal colony is going to take most of the next decade to accomplish, and would ultimately end up requiring an act of parliament. In 1729, the proprietors would officially be bought out, thus ending their control over the colony. The end of proprietary control in 1729 covered not just South Carolina, but North Carolina as well. In so many ways, the situation in North Carolina mirrored the events in the South, though there would be some distinct differences. The colonists up in North Carolina were not exactly thrilled with their lives under the thumbs of the proprietors. The colony had been rocked in the 1710s by what would become known as Cary's Rebellion. North Carolina much like the South, had struggled with questions over the degree of religious toleration that they were willing to allow within the colony. There were attempts in 1701 and 1704 to pass a vestry bill. Under this bill, those who were religious dissenters 
or more specifically those who are not part of the Anglican Church, would find themselves on the outside of the political apparatus looking in. As was the case in South Carolina, local parishes were allowed to use public funds for their upkeep. The problem in North Carolina, however, was that the colony had a sizable number of Quakers who had no interest in paying money towards Anglican churches. Furthermore, the Anglicans in the assembly fought back against allowing Quakers to affirm rather than take an oath. Remember that Quakers are very against having to take an oath of any kind. The 1689 Toleration Bill in England, the one that William Penn had his fingerprints all over, protected the rights of Quakers to affirm rather than take an official oath. The North Carolina Assembly, however, had decided that affirming was simply not going to fly. What this has the effect of doing is creating a major rift between the two leading groups in the colony, the Anglicans and the Quakers. Now, as if to make things even more complicated, the Anglicans themselves were not really a unified group either. Among the Anglicans, there had developed two major factions, one under William Glover and the other under Thomas Carey. Carey was, in general, in support of the Quakers and wanted to protect their rights, whereas Glover wanted to take a much harsher approach. Carey, who had been the governor during the late 1690s, had been replaced by Glover and had become concerned with what he was seeing. The fighting between the two groups, those supporting Carey versus those supporting Glover, became such a problem that the Privy Council back in London ordered the proprietors to appoint somebody to quell the situation. The proprietors named Edward Hyde as the new governor of the colony in 1711. As you can probably guess, however, from the fact that I mentioned the term Carey's Rebellion, this move did little to pacify the angry colonists. After a bit of theatrics put on by Hyde to convince the Carey faction that he was there to cool down the situation, he would end up falling decidedly into the Glover model of governance. Carey, who was obviously displeased about this, decided that the time was ripe for him to take action. Carey attempted to overthrow the Hyde government in North Carolina. As for the overthrow attempt, this was not exactly Bacon's rebellion or the overthrow of Edmund Andros. Hyde requested and received assistance from Virginia. The rebellion was quickly put down and Carey was shipped off to London to be tried for his actions. Ultimately, the charges against Carey would be dismissed, and the proprietors decided that Hyde was just not their guy. Regardless of this, ultimately North Carolina would end up passing the Vestry Law, allowing public funds to be used to pay for Anglican churches. Nothing about this entire ordeal had helped endear the proprietors to the population. Yes, the Anglicans did maintain a political majority. However, it is not as though the Quakers were a small portion of the population. This sizable portion of the population had now largely been told by the proprietors that their rights were inconsequential. Likewise, much like we see in South Carolina, North Carolina was subjected to attacks along the frontiers from local tribes. Well, it was not as much of an issue in North Carolina as it was in South Carolina. There was never a North Carolina version of the Yamasee War. It was still a problem. The largest attack would come against frontier traders and was led by the Tuscarora tribe in 1711. North Carolina was able to defeat them with the aid of Virginia and South Carolina. Despite this, however, some 200 colonists had been killed. Just as we are going to see a few years in the future with the Yamasee War in South Carolina, the proprietors provided absolutely zero assistance. The fact that the proprietors refused to send help and generally wanted nothing to do with the defense of the colony was noted both internally by the colonists and externally by London. This point would further be driven home a few years later when the proprietors would ignore the Yamasee War in much the same fashion. The Crown had also grown concerned over the close relationship between North Carolina and pirates. We had discussed this relationship back in episode 3.10 when we talked about North Carolina Governor Charles Eden. If you'll recall from that episode, it was Eden that Blackbeard would initially surrender to, as Eden had become well known to be friendly with pirates. This was something that was very disturbing to the Crown, who was actively trying to root out the problem of piracy in the Americas. 
much as was the case in South Carolina in 1720. 1718 would prove to be the fateful year for North Carolina. Following 1718, the Crown demanded that they have the final say and ability to vet the governors of the colony. For all intents and purposes, North Carolina was now a royal colony following 1718. As was true for South Carolina as well, it was not until 1729, in that same act of Parliament, that the proprietors would be bought out by the Crown and hence divested of their interest in the Carolinas. It is worth noting that the proprietors were not left totally high and dry here either. The proprietors were paid £2,500 each for their shares, which for most of them was perfectly fine. The proprietors had never really made much of a profit on the colony, and the chance to get paid to walk away was something that they were all more than happy to accept. Well, most of them were happy to accept. Of the eight Lord Proprietors, only seven would ultimately end up selling back. John Carteret, the great-grandson of Sir George Carteret, would retain his share. To deal with this annoyance, an area that would become known as the Granville District was formed. This district was a 60-mile-wide strip that went along the border of North Carolina and Virginia. This would lead to all kinds of border disputes and land battles in North Carolina a situation that would not be fully resolved up until the American Revolution. It is also worth mentioning that this district would prove to be a haven for loyalists during the Revolution. With the end of the proprietors came the end of the fundamental constitution of Carolina. One of the strangest forms of government that we see form in the colonies, it would prove to be largely ineffective. The government was cumbersome and required immense amounts of population in order to function properly. In the end, conditions would never really prove to be conducive to see how the system could function ideally. Really, however, the biggest problem that we have seen here this week is a problem that we have seen before. It was those absentee proprietors. Time and time again, we have seen problems that arise from having proprietors in London that have no concept of what was really going on in their colony. Oftentimes, these proprietors have little sense about the political realities in the colony itself, and likewise have little control or authority within their own colony. Interestingly enough, we find that oftentimes these same proprietors themselves were more than happy to bail out of the game. We had seen this with William Penn, who was desperate to be done with Pennsylvania by the end of his life. Likewise, this week, we find that seven of the eight proprietors of Carolina were more than happy to ride off into the sunset with their settlements in hand. Next time, we are going to turn our attention to the last colony to come onto the scene. Specifically, we are going to be traveling to Georgia. We will look at the colony's development, who the colonists were, and ultimately what they were seeking. After that, we will finally have all of the original colonies up and on their feet. Until then, I hope you all have a fantastic two weeks. I hope that you are staying healthy and staying safe. And I will see you all back here next time as we explore the founding of Georgia. Georgia.